number two. I'm going to vary a little bit tonight from First John, even though they're very similar in their books toward the end of the New Testament. Uh, I want to, uh, the Lord's put on my heart these churches here found in the uh, earlier parts of Revelation. Uh, God's given me seven messages. I don't know if I'll preach them all in a row, especially being around Christmas. Uh, but they are going to come to a pulpit near you uh, very soon. And uh, so you'll, you'll hear them. I don't know if they'll be consecutive, but I'm going to preach them in a chronological order. Uh, and, and I do want you to um, uh, notice these are real churches. Uh, they are not fictitious. They're not um, uh, imaginary. These were real churches. And uh, though we do su study that there are the, the church age that we believe in, and of course we're living in one of those church ages now, the very last church age before Jesus Christ comes, and we're in that uh, cold, and and, uh, and and the Lord says that uh, I'd rather you be cold or hot, but but we've become lukewarm, and that's that that Laodicea, and and we'll get to that, but we're we're a little ways from that. I want you to notice some things though found in Revelation two about this church in Ephesus, uh, Revelation chapter two, and look at verse number one. The Bible says unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Notice what he says. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And, are, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not. And hast found them liars. And hast borne, and, uh, and hast patience for my name's sake, hast labored, and, not fa and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do thy first works, do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. We thank you that we can study these churches. I pray that, God, it would help our church here. In Jesus' name, amen. There's four applications that I want you to see tonight in these seven verses I want you to see them real quick. Number one, this first application is the local churches in John's day. These were actual local churches. Like I said earlier, they were churches uh, in John's day. John, uh, of course, the revelator who writes about these churches under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. Number two, not only is it local churches in John's day, but these are churches in our day. We actually experience these churches today. We're living in days where uh, churches are, uh, as we describe here in this first church, we'll see some similarities and, and uh, apply them to our day. And then these were periods of time in church history. So these were, uh, we, we study the Bible dispensationally, and we know that these were, these were churches in a, in a period of time in church history. And then these were churches, I believe, during representation and application, could be churches during the tribulation period. And uh, there's some application to these four, I believe, four applications that we can study these seven churches out in uh, the book of Revelation. Ephesus is being the first church. Uh, we can see Ephesus is uh, means the purposed church is what I've kind of coined Ephesus. It was a purposed church. It represents the period of church history between the time 33 A.D. and 200 A.D. So this is a time period of, of a church age that has lasted about 167 years uh, during this church age. I want you to notice some things about this church, this church of Ephesus, and then I want to apply what we learn from these churches to our church. And then I want you to take it even past your church, and I want you to look at yourself and examine yourself and where you fit into this church. I want you to notice their position. Look at verses 1 uh, through verse 3. The Bible says, Under the church, uh, uh, angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, I know thy works and thy labor, 
and thy patience, and, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. Notice verse 1, that these people are blessed. They're blessed. Hey, can I say tonight that this church here is blessed? Amen. Hey, you looked, uh, just, just, you saw just a minute ago these young people up in this choir loft. And folks, if it would not remind you about the blessings of God, I don't know what, what's wrong with you. Amen. I mean, we had a whole uh, platform full of kids singing to the top of their lungs. And that, listen, there's many churches tonight that don't have any young people. Matter of fact, I had a man walk out the door this morning and he said, Preacher, the reason my family is here, my, myself and several daughters, is because the church that we just came from had no young people. He said, I'm talking about it's just within a stone's throw of this church. He said, there was absolutely no young people at that church. It was just older folks. And he said, if a young family were to come in or a young child were to come in, they looked at them like, we don't want you here. Friend, that's not a blessed church. That's a dead church. We're a blessed church. We want young people. You know what young people do? They add life. Amen. Now you may have some disasters every now and then, but we're going to be a blessed church. Amen. And we need that because that's, that's the blessings of God. And uh, the, number two, we see verse two, they're not only blessed, but they're busy. They're busy. Look at what verse two says. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. I mean, they're a busy crowd. And how thou uh, canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them that say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. That's a busy group of people. They're laboring. They're, they're, I mean, they're examining whether these people are real apostles or are they fakes, they're liars. He said, I mean, you are busy. Your labor, your patience, thy works. So they're busy. Uh, what are they busy in, preacher? Well, there's involvement. He said, I know thy works. There's intolerance in, in the latter part of verse 2. Uh, labor and patience. They're, they're not to bear evil. They don't bear evil. They don't put up with evil. They were a holy church. You know, can I say tonight that we're supposed to be a holy church? Holy church set apart. And, uh, and then number three, they were inspecting, because notice what it says, and thou hast tried them that which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. You know what this church did? If someone came in and said, I'm an apostle, uh, they would say, well, we'll prove it. I mean, they didn't just believe what somebody said. They actually examined them. You know, and, and matter of fact, and found them, the Bible, look at verse 2, the end of verse 2, and found them liars. That means that there was actually some people, Brother Daniel, that came in the back of the church or came in somehow through the church and said, well, yep, I'm an apostle. And the church found out that these people were not what they said they were. Found them to be liars. See, uh, apostles have signs according to Mark chapter 16. Turn over to Mark 16 if you would please. I, I want to show you some things of what an apostle is. How many of you has ever seen on a church sign today someone that called themselves an apostle? Would you raise your hand? Can I show you what a, an apostle is? Because if that person is apostle, they are at least 2,000 years old, alright? Can I show you what an apostle is? Turn over to Mark chapter 16, and I would like to see that myself. Matter of fact, I would join their church if they were a real apostle. And, uh, and, and I would like to see that and be a part of one of the apostles' church. But they're not an apostle. Amen. Can I just tell you that right now? Mark chapter 16, look at verse number 17. Now this is the apostles. This is what an apostle is. The Bible says in Mark 16, 17, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with the new tongues. Verse 18, They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. They've been given signs. These apostles have been given signs. I don't know anybody today living that's raising the dead, healing the sick, drinking poison, being bit by serpents, and still living through all that. I don't know anybody that God has given them. Now, there may be some out there, but I'll tell you, it ain't of God. It may be of the devil, but it's not of God. And uh, because the apostles... Can I show you what the qualification of an apostle is? Turn over to Acts, if you would. Now, that's what the apostles did. God gave, them, uh, God gave them the power to perform miracles because the Jews required a sign. Now notice in Acts chapter 1, and turn over to verse 21 and 22. I'll show you what the qualifications of an apostle is. So if you call yourself an apostle, this is what you must fall into this category according to the Bible. 
verse 21 and verse 22, the Bible says, Wherefore of these men which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Verse 22, Beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a what? A witness. Say it again. A what? Witness. With us of His what? Resurrection. You had to witness His resurrection. You had to witness, I mean an eyewitness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is an apostle. So anyone who would call themselves an apostle would have to have seen the resurrected Lord. Amen. That friend, anybody living today. So, can I get back to the message? I don't want to. I don't want to go off on a rabbit trail. We could get on apostates and people call themselves something that they're not. But can I say that this church was busy doing the Lord's business by folks coming in the church saying, "Oh yeah, I'm an apostle," and after checking them out and 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 scrutinizing them, not pharisaical, but making sure these people are what they said they were, finding them to be liars. That's what this church did. They were busy. They started out on the right foot. Uh, they, they had to see John's baptism in order to be a qualification of an apostle, and they saw the resurrected Christ. So I want you to notice that they were blessed, they were busy, but then I want you to notice they were burdened. Look at verse number 3. And has borne in Revelation 2, verse 3, and has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. They were burdened. Serving for His namesake will keep you from fainting, will it not? See, if you do it for the preacher, you'll faint. If you do it for somebody else in the church, you'll faint. You say, well, preacher, I'm, I'm working that bus route for you and I want to please you. That's great, but that's going to last about a year. It's going to last about six months. I'll sing in the choir, preacher, but only if you're, only if you're doing it. No, I want you to sing for Jesus. I want you to teach that Sunday school class and, and, and do it for the Lord. Hey, listen, it's going to last if you do it for the Savior. Can I say this tonight, church? If you are in this thing, for instance, if you're having married, uh, marriage trouble and the only reason that you want to reconcile is to please your wife, that's not going to last. Amen. You should try to please Christ and if your wife is right with God, it will please her. That's what will last. Same thing goes with the church. If you strive to please Christ, everybody's going to be okay. Hey, things are going to fall into place. So we see they were burdened. They served for His namesake. They, it, it'll keep you from fainting. Hey, church, let's not faint. Hey, let's not give up. Let's not get weary in well-doing. Uh, let's not lay down by the wayside. Let's keep pressing toward the mark. Amen? Let's keep going toward the prize and keep pressing. Hey, I don't want to see casualties on the side of the road. I know we're going to see some along the way. But can I tell you, hey, let's the majority of us, let's keep on the fire in line. Amen? and let's keep pressing on and keep the burden real. Then they were bold. Look at verse number 6. The Bible says, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. No, I want you to notice, uh, it comes from two words, this word Nicolaitans. It comes from the word Nikio, to conquer, and lady, the common people. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1-4, through 4, uh, the pastor is to lead by example and not to conquer. Amen. So uh, uh, these Nicolaitans, they, they beat their people. They kind of browbeat their people and forced them and manipulated them into doing things and kind of led with a dictor dictatorship. And they, uh, but bless God, if you don't do this, I'm going to beat you over the head with this and make sure, I mean, you're nothing. And they lifted themselves up and beat the people down to a point where the people were nothing and the man of God was everything. And friend, that ain't the way it's supposed to be. That's not true pastoring. Pastoring is being a shepherd to the flock. Amen? Feeding the flock. So these Nicolaitans, uh, they did not lead by example. They led to conquer. First Peter chapter 5, verse 2. The Bible says, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. So the pastor is not to fleece the flock and try to get all he gets. Filthy lucre means that he's in it for money. 
Man, there's pastors around that they they're just uh, hey they, they I mean they listen folks it's it's fine to take care of your pastor and this church this church does a great job taking care of my family but folks there's a time where if a pastor's in it for the money can I tell you uh, I could be making a whole lot more money in the business world of things than in the I didn't get in the ministry for money and if you did you're in it for filthy lucre there's no money in ministry if you do it the right way. Man, if it, it's all about helping people. Now, I'm for a church taking care of the pastor, and I think a church will be cursed if they don't. And they, uh, listen, there's churches that I've preached for, and the man, he's been pastoring that church for 25 years and still working a job, and the church is well off enough to, and they just, they don't pay his insurance, they don't take care of him, they don't do, and, and I'm telling that church has not grown, and you can see how damp and cold the church is because they've never taken an initiative to take care of their man of God. Hey, folks, that's not the case here and I praise the Lord for it but on the other side I've seen churches that the pastor is just give me all you can and it's hurt the church now there's a balance and there ought to be a balance but can I tell you there's a lot of churches that they're listen this the pastor's not of a ready mind he's in it for filthy lucre and he's he's constraining the people constraining them verse 3 says neither as being lords over God's heritage but being examples to the flock Amen. So the pastor is not to lord over the people. You know, the pastor that has his hand in everything. You know? I mean, folks, I'm, not, I'm just not as talented and gifted to do that. That's why God has given a good nucleus of people that to surround the pastor and say, hey, can you take care of this for me? Now, let me know about things, but, but I want you to take care of this for me. And, and if you've got a problem, see me about it. And uh, that's pastoral leadership. Get, give people responsibility. Delegate authority and give people things. But the pastor shouldn't be overseeing every aspect of the ministry and, 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 and lording over people. Uh, listen, uh, I'm not to here to lord over you. I'm here to pastor you. And if I can't trust you with a Sunday school class unless me stepping in there or tapping into your cell phone and listening to what you're saying, then, friend, I shouldn't even be here. Amen. Amen. It's just bib. I'm just being straight with you tonight. Uh, the pastor can't do everything, and that therefore God should send people around that pastor to help hold his hands up and say, "Preacher, I'll I'll help you along the way. I'll I'll do what I can. I, I'm not going to try to steal and try to take away from the ministry and try to uh, uh, take away and 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 try to get people and and corner folks over here and try to take away from the church. I'm here to hold your hands up and just and, and whatever you need. I'm just going to be here and help. Hey, folks, that's that's what biblical pastoring is amen and that's what it should be feed the flock of God that's my number one job I read this text often to remind me what my number one duty is is to preach the word preach the word I mean right here on front of this nice beautiful pulpit it says preach the word 2 Timothy 4 2 what's my number one duty to preach the word be filled with the spirit when I get behind this pulpit if I'm not ready to preach then I have failed I've got to feed you. I've got to feed you. I want you so fat when you leave here tonight. I mean that your eyes are all closed. You're swelled up. You say, Preacher, fed me tonight. I don't want to starve you. Now there's some folks I could bring in and in, in behind this pulpit and do a whole lot better job. But I want you to at least leave and say, Boy, he dumped a basket load on me tonight. I want, you to, I want the Bible to feed you. And I want to be able to help you. So clergy is not to rule over lady, uh, laity. Uh, uh, read Bible, pray, and serve. That's what your job is to do. Read your Bible, pray, and serve in the church, and be faithful. Hey, by all means, be faithful. Amen. Be faithful. You know, Lee Robertson used to say, uh, Doctor Lee Robertson used to say, three to thrive, three to thrive. What do you mean? Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, folks. That's still true today. I realize there's some of you here that cannot make it on Wednesday night prayer meeting due to work schedule and all these different things. But folks, if you are, by all means can make it out Wednesday nights, we have just as good a services on Wednesday nights as we do Sunday night. Amen. I appreciate those of you that work in children's ministries. 
I appreciate those of you on Sunday morning that work in the teen ministry, Brother Dirk and, and Miss Lori and others that have headed that up where we'd have a bunch of teens in here on Sunday morning, wouldn't really have seats to, to put them at, at for adults and different things. And they take a group of teens over there and preach to them. And I appreciate that. I appreciate all the children's workers that you never see on Wednesday nights. Uh, Miss Gloria and, and, and Miss Pam and Brother Peter's over there sometimes. And my wife and different ones, Brother Dave and Miss Rebecca and, and uh, the Milligans and different ones even with the juniors and all. You never see them, but they're feeding these kids the Word of God. Hey, it's important. It's important to do that. Folks, we need you. You nursery workers. You, you say, well, how important is it to keep the nursery? It's very important. Because the Word of God... Friend, if we had every baby in here on Sunday morning, uh, you couldn't hear, probably hear anything. I mean, you one baby in this in this building like this can be a distract. Now listen, it doesn't distract me. I'll just keep preaching. But it does distract others. Folks, every ministry of this church is important. Can I say that again? Every ministry of this church is important. If, we, if you're doing one little thing, you say, Preacher, all I'm doing is holding the door for people. It's important. Why? Because the church is important. Everything is important. God's business is the greatest business in all the world. Then we see uh, number uh, two. We see not only their uh, not only their position, but notice their problem. Look at verse four. The Bible says, "Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love." See, Paul writes to Ephesus as a great church on fire, but notice what John writes. He writes in a different tone. John writes to Ephesus as a good church that is fading. Two different men, two great men, Paul and John, but two ways they write to Ephesus. One writes as a church on fire. The other one writes as a church that is fading away. I want you to notice the Savior's comment. Look at verse 4. He says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. We see the Savior's comment, I have something against you. There's a lot of good things about you, but i got something against you. Then he says, we see the church's condition, because thou hast left thy first love. Preacher, what, what's the first love? Well, I believe it's a purposeful condition. He says, thou hast left. Thou hast left. So they left that first love. It's a personal condition. Notice what he says, thy. It's personal it's a primary condition. The first love is the hardest to keep. The first love, it's, it's the hardest. You say, well, what is that first love? It's love for worship, for Him. Yes, sir. Folks, we can't lose our worship. That's right. Amen. Can't lose our worship. Hey, friend, listen. I, I, I want to get in here and I want to worship God. We don't come here to worship God. I want you to bring your worship to church. Amen. While you're worshiping God, bring it to church and let's worship Him together. Amen? You don't go to church to worship God. Hey, you go to church to bring your worship with you to church. Amen. Don't lose your worship. Hey, don't lose your, your uh, shout. Hey, don't lose your tears. Don't lose your testifying. Amen. Don't lose your burden. You say, preacher, it, it all, by the way, don't lose your giving. It's a form of worship. Worship. Hey, it's the grace of God. Don't lose that. Hey, don't lose it. So we love to worship. And by the way, if the only time you ever shout is in church, something's wrong. I'll be honest. You Listen, if you don't find yourself listening to something in your car or listening to something at your house or watching something, and, and boy, the Spirit of God just comes over you and tears and, and just bubbling up inside of you, hey, and you're, you're just having a spell inside your car, hey, it shouldn't, but, but I wonder about somebody, the only time they ever say amen is when somebody's looking. May not be true worship. We see love for worship. We see love for the Word, preaching and reading. Let me say this real quick and I'll move on. Those that have a hard time with preaching have a spiritual condition. I've watched people, I've watched the last few weeks. And folks, can I tell you right now, if there's anybody in this church that is watching, I'm watching. Like I'm watching all the time. I'm watching while I'm preaching. I'm watching people. I'm watching your countenance. I'm watching, and I've watched people the last few weeks. And, I, I'll, and you're not fooling me. You're not fooling me. I'm watching people that they'll show up for Sunday school and they'll sit in here for a little bit and they'll leave and, and they'll, or they'll, they'll, they'll avoid it. I, I know who's standing in that hallway during Sunday school. I know who's standing in that hallway during church. You're not going to church. You purposely avoid preaching. 
Folks, can I tell you, your heart is not right with God if you purposely avoid... Can I say that again? Live stream, listen to me. You, If you are purposely avoiding church... I'm looking at you in the eyes right now. I don't know who's watching, but I'm, if you're purposely avoiding preaching, you're not right with God. Not right with God. Well, I'll go over here to this ministry. When's the last time I've seen you? I need a body to preach to. Amen. I'm not trying to be hateful. If I spend hours to study, I'd like for you to at least give me an hour of your time. Amen. Oh, I'll catch the rerun on Facebook. No, you won't. There's no such thing as the hallway ministry. Well, and by the way, if you recruit somebody to help you in a ministry, listen, let me know. Because it could be they're on spiritual life support. Well, I asked so and so, well, have they been to church in the last three weeks? What are they doing helping you out, pal? They need preaching. God chose the foolishness of preaching. He did not choose the foolishness of Sunday school. He did not choose the foolishness of, of singing in the choir and music. God chose the foolishness of preaching. And He needs a preacher. And by the way, you do too. You can't make it on one week of preaching. One day of preaching. One, one sermon of preaching. Well, I'll, I'll look forward to seeing you next week, preacher. Hey, we need preaching. I need it. I need it. I love for the word, man. If I park right there, folks, I'm telling you, I may not get to, I may not get to point number three, but I'll tell you, we need preaching. But hey, let me tell you what made America great again. Preaching made made, made, made America great again. Not a president. Matter of fact, it's impossible for a president to make America great again. You know what's going to make America great again? Preaching is. Preaching. Hey, I'm talking about opening up the Word of God and let, I mean, loosening your, t get bug-eyed and your veins popping out, spit coming out, and preaching the Word of God. Man, I don't want somebody getting up behind the pulpit, sounding like they got a mouthful of marbles. Hey, just looking around at the ground, don't know what to say. Preach the Word. Preach the Word. Hey, I want this church to be built on Bible preaching. Matter of fact, it's the name of our church. Bible Baptist Church. Everything should be based on the Word of God. And if you avoid the preached Word of God, then my friend, you're not right with God. Get in where they're preaching the Bible. Nobody should be in a corner somewhere on Sunday or out here in the parking lot or on the side of a bus or at Bojangles or the QT. Hey, preaching time. Get in here where it's preaching I, I, listen, I, I love it, but if my mama prepared a supper and said, be here at 6 o'clock, it's going to be hot. Hey, you better believe I'm going to be... Matter of fact, I'm going to get there a little early. Amen? I'm, I, leftovers are great. I've been eating leftovers since Thanksgiving. But leftovers ain't the same as they are on Thanksgiving Day. Amen? I like it when I get it fresh and hot. I like going by the Krispy Kreme when it says, hot and now. Well, this message right here is hot and now. We ought to have a hot and now sign out here on the sign. Hey, get in here. Hot and now. Preaching is preaching time. And you ought to be in, uh, on in fellowship and be here faithfully. Then number three, the love for winning souls. Love for winning souls, a burden. Man, a burden. We ought to not just preach in here, but preach out on the street. Do you know this, that every one of you been been called to preach? You may not be called to preach behind a pulpit. We know that God has reserved that for men. Men are called to preach. But can I say this, friend? We're all been commanded to preach the gospel to every creature. Every creature needs a preacher. And can I say, not only a love for winning souls, but a love for the work. Serve. Find a place and serve. Notice what verse 5 says. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. Repent and do the first works. The first what? Works. Let's say it together. The first what? Works. He says, go back to what you used to do. We're not, we're not called to sit on a pew and sit soaking sour. Well, I'm just going to go to that church and sit down. Find a place and serve. Find a, listen, you may not be able to work with young people, but you can work with somebody. You can disciple you can teach. Oh, preacher, I don't know if I can sing. Okay. 
But can you do this? Can you do that? Can we give you some things to do? Can you can you help out in this? Can you can you uh, usher? Can you uh, watch the parking lot? Can you direct traffic? Hey, oh man, this ministry is going to continue to grow, and we're going to have, I believe, multiple buildings and multiple things. There's going to be multiple areas where we can continue to grow in. Hey, where are you at in this whole vision? Of where the church goes, we see the promise. The promise says, remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works, or else I will come thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Notice what he says. There's a promise. Your memory. Verse 5. Remember. Not from whence you were lifted, but notice what he says. From whence thou art fallen. He didn't say remember where you were lifted at. He said remember where you started to fall. Think about that, church. Remember. Remember, every church is just a few years from closing its doors. Every church. Every church is only a few years away from shutting down. My dad one day picked me up, and I've told the story here, but he, he said, son, let's go eat lunch. And we had a sack lunch there. He had we, we drove over, and I think we went in the convenience store and got some nab crackers and a soda. And he said, I want you to look across the street. We sitting right across the street from a, looked like a church building, but it wasn't. It was a drafting company. He just started to cry. I mean, I, I was eating my, my, my food, and I happened to look over at him, and, I, and Dad, boy, tears were welled up in his eyes, and he was crying, and I said, Dad, what's wrong? I thought he brought me out there to tell me something. I thought I was fired. <laughs> then I remembered my mom, and he said, He can't fire me. <laughs> I thought something was desperately wrong, and he just looking at, he was looking at, uh, looking at this church right across the street, and I said, What's wrong? And he said, Son, I used to preach meetings in that church. And I said, what? And he said, I, used to, I said, Dad, that's a drafting company. He said, oh no, years ago it used to be a good church. But it closed its doors because it left its first love. First love. Folks, I don't want that ever be said about Bible Baptist Church. Do you know how many businesses would love to have this whole property right here? You know, if we put this whole property up for sale, I believe it would be sold in just a few days. Somebody would love to have this and turn this into something and we could just fold it up just like a lot of churches and just say, hey, we can't pay the bills anymore, can't pay the mortgage anymore. We're just going to fold it up. We, there's no use. There's no God here anymore. You know how many churches do that every year? They fold up. Leave. Quit. Folks, we can't do that. He says, remember from whence thou art lifted uh, or, or from whence thou art fallen. He don't remember where you were lifted at. From whence thou art fallen. Then we see our manifestation. He says, repent. Repentance. He said, refine your first works. And then notice your misery. Look at the latter part of that. He says, and I will come thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick from out of its place except thou repent. You know, two times in that one verse he says the word repent. Repent. He says, remember from whence thou art fallen, repent. Then he says on down at the end of the verse, he says repent. The, the speed we see quickly. He uses that word quickly. And then we see the solitude. He uses that word remove. Uh, we see this memory. Them are not very pleasant words that John is saying there. Then we see the message. Look at verse 7. There's something in this message that I want you to notice and I'll be done. Look at verse 7. He says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Notice the listening. Listening. Verse 7. He that hath an ear. I'm looking at a bunch of people tonight that have ears. Matter of fact, I don't know anybody in here that's deaf. I would love to see a deaf ministry started here. I believe there's a few people that God has placed in position here that might get help us with a deaf ministry. There is a need. I don't know where they're at tonight, but there's somebody that would probably go to church if they could hear or understand. I would love it. I was preaching in Jacksonville, Florida this past week, and while I was preaching, there was a lady over here interpreting to a few people. that, that And by the way, while I was preaching, they were over there shaking their head, grinning. And then after the service, I signed their Bible, and they, they were, they were, and I didn't know, but I could just read their lips a little bit, and they said, we enjoyed the service. And man, I was so thrilled that they could understand what was said. There's a need there. Hey, think about this though, the listening. I'm not preaching to deaf people. He said, he that hath an ear, let him hear. The listening. 
He wants you to listen to what... So if Christ is telling us to listen, we better perk our ears up. I wonder how many times the Word of God is being preached behind this pulpit and it's falling on deaf ears. It's falling on deaf ears. How many times we're preaching and it's just bouncing around like an echo. Oh, we've heard this. My dad the other night, he... Um, he said, son, he said, I've been preaching the same church for 30... He's working on his 34th year next Sunday. 34 years at the same church. He said, son, I've, I've preached everything I know to preach. He said, I know it's an inexhaust, inexhaustible book. He said, but I've preached a lot of messages in 34 years of this crowd. He said, often I feel like they're just looking at me. 34 years. And people just they take it for granted. Do you understand tonight that there is a book that's open tonight that's living and breathing? And there's a man behind the pulpit that's not afraid to preach it to you. And let me just tell you right this, hey, while it's being preached, while the sign says hot and now, be listening. Hey, when these kids are small, hey, everybody, hey, when these kids are small, but think about it, it won't be long before these kids are grown and they're teenagers and graduating high school. Hey, mom and dad, are you still going to be on fire like you are tonight? You will be if you're listening. See, a lot of times we preach and people think they've got it all figured out. For all preacher, I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. I'm good. I mean, preacher, I've heard that message before. I've heard somebody preach on this church at Ephesus. I, I've heard somebody preach out of Revelation too. Preacher, I know what you're saying. I know that if we, if we don't do what God wants us to do, that He'll come in and remove thy candlestick. I know that we'll lose the power of God. Hey, but are you listening? Are you listening to the Spirit? He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit say. Number two, I believe not only the message here is the listening, but notice the lifting. Because notice what he says. In verse 7, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life. We see a lifting. So now there's something that if you do listen, He said, I'm going to give you, to him that overcometh, will I give to him to eat of the tree of life. That's encouraging. There's a lifting part of this verse. He said, if you'll do what the Word of God says, I'm going to bless you for it. I'm going to bless you for it. You know what church, can I say 10 years from now, this church does not need to leave or does not have to leave its first love. Matter of fact, if my vision is right and my prayer is right and my preaching is right and my, the, the Word of God is in my heart and I don't lose my vision and burden for the lost and, and you pray for me, it's the grace of God that I am what I am. But can I tell you, if we will stay on track, there is no telling what God can do with this church. No telling. But it only takes us losing that vision. It only takes us losing the vision and becoming a social club. You know, a lot of churches have turned into social clubs where now it's their four walls and everything they do includes that four walls. And you've got to be a member to do this. And you've got to be doing this. And, and let's just keep our little four and no more. And we're just going to keep it like this and shut everybody out. But folks, that ain't a church. It's a social club. We're not flashing ID cards at the door. No, it's come. Hey, if you want to hear the gospel preached, come. If you want to see Jesus change your life, come. Hey, come. I don't care what you look like, what skin color you are, what you smell like, where you came from. Hey, come. That's what a church should be. And there's a lifting. There's a promise. Then number three, I believe there's a living. Because notice what it says. Eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. There's a promised life right here. Not only is there a lifting part, not only is there a listening part, but there is a living part. I would like to have a living church. I'd like to have a living church. You ever been a part of a dead church? You ever been in a service where the church, I mean, where you know there's the Spirit of God's not here? That is a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous place to be. Folks, can I tell you right now, while you're here tonight, soak it up. Boy, me and my family, in the last year and a half, we've been soaking it up. I mean, we've been just... We go home on Sunday nights, and me and my wife, and, and all through the week, we're just talking about what God did. Uh, God uh, saved uh, Kayla last, uh, last week. Caleb, God, I got your name right, didn't I? You can't get me tonight. Uh, God saved Kayla last week. You know what me and my wife talked about this week? God saved Kayla. 
If nothing else happened last week, God saved that gal. Hey, there's a woman that got saved sitting on that second row Sunday morning. Hey, God saved her. Two saved in one Sunday. Hey, praise God. Hey, that's not a dead church. That's a living church. And that's a listening church. And that's a lifting church. People left last Sunday. People left this morning. I even preached on anger. And people walked out saying, Preacher, that was, boy, that's what I needed. Why? Because that is where we're at. The Word of God is a living book. And if we'll do exactly what we're supposed to do. Hey, Ephesus started out right. They did. I mean, they were a working church, a laboring church. I mean, buddy. But then he said, nevertheless. Ooh. When he said that about that church, he said, you've left your first love. Guess what? I believe, here's what I believe. Church, look at me and I'm done. We're at 703. We're good. Steelers don't come on to 820. I'm joking. Let me just say this, listen. If we ever get too busy that we leave our first love, we're too busy. We're too busy. I believe the problem with Ephesus was they had so many busy ministries and busy people that they lost focus of the prize. The prize was magnifying Jesus Christ. The prize was pointing men and women to Jesus Christ and the gospel of Christ. I believe every ministry of this church ought to have one sole purpose, and that is to get people saved. Point every kid to the... I mean, if we ever start a daycare one day, and I, I, I aim to do it. You say, why? It's a ministry. Oh, yeah, it's a need. We've got children running out our ears. What a need. What, we, we don't have facilities quite yet, but one day we could. You know what we need to do when we start having these children at a daycare and maybe a Christian school one day and maybe a, a, a maybe who knows, maybe a Bible college one day and maybe a mission board one day. Who knows what will happen, but every goal, everything should point men and women to Jesus Christ. We're not in this thing to make money. We're not in this thing to have popularity. We're not in this thing to magnify our church and the community. We're in this thing to point men and women to Jesus Christ and love people. And if we ever lose that, oh, look at all the things we've got and all the millions we've got in the bank and all the things that we've got. Folks, that's not interesting if you've lost or left your first love. I believe Ephesus just lost focus. They lost the focus of the prize. They lost focus of the goal and... My friend, Brother Mark Stroud, says if you ever get too busy or if the devil can't get you to be bad, he'll get you to be busy. And that's the truth. If he can't get you to trip up, he'll just get you busy. Too busy to read your Bible. Too busy to pray. Too busy to come to church. You know, I've prayed for some of you. I've prayed for a lot of you. I pray for you daily. We've got a, a, a list, a long list. Even people I don't even know that visit the church, I'm praying for them. And by the way, I, I'm seeing God do some things. They're coming back and... And, and just connecting and, and getting to know folks through prayer. But many of you, I've prayed for lots of things in your life. I've prayed for some of you a job. You've come to me and said, Preacher, I've needed a job or my job's about to change and all. But you know what my, 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 my worry is about that is God will bless you with a job, but that job will then become a curse. I've seen it happen a million times. Preacher, pray for me. I used to work with teenagers all, my whole life my whole ministry and uh, the dreadful thing out of a teenager's mouth the one, the most dreadful thing that I, I hated the most when they they turned 16 I, I applied for a job man they were doing so good spiritually and then all of a sudden they'd come and say preacher I'm applying for a job and guess what before you know it no youth activities teen soul winning I'll say hey where you at oh I gotta work well man you were doing so good yeah, but i got to pay for my cell phone, my car insurance, and my driver's license, and I'm paying for this kind of saving money. All those things were okay. But it took them from the main thing. Man, you're going to work the rest of your life. Why are you going to work at 16? Why start when you're a child? Oh, but, oh well, you know, I've got to have some money. Do you really? Man, 16 years old pretty early. And I used to tell them, Mom, Dad, are you serious? You're making them work at 16? Well, they need to learn responsibility. They don't even know how to... Pop a pimple yet? I mean, and you're getting them out of here, and you're working them. I hated that. You know what? Adults ain't much better. Preacher, pray for me. I need a job. Okay, I'll pray. But am I going to see you on Sunday? Because I ain't going to pray if you're going to miss church on Sunday. I'll be honest. 
Folks, let me tell you, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Now, I realize sometimes jobs do take people, and I'm not getting on to you. I know you've got to do what you've got to do. But folks, I'm not going to pray for a, a job that takes you away from God. I'm going to pray for you something to get you closer to God that will provide for your family. and get. I'm, I love it when I see you being blessed. I love it. I love it when you say, Preacher, I got that job. Hallelujah. Hey, I'm for you. God answers prayer. But I want to see you. I want to see you. Folks, let's not leave our first love. Let's not make our job our first love. Let's not make our bass boat our first love. Let's not make our children our first love. Let's make Him. And then if that's right, everything else will be right. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads.